Hello everyone. Thank you for joining me today. I hope that all of you listening are fit and well. I also hope and pray that you'll be blessed by this study. This is the seventh sermon in our series looking at the Apostle Paul's letter to Titus. We'll be looking today at the opening to chapter 3. And our reading is Titus chapter 3 verses 1 to 3. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. This is the word of the Lord. Last time we considered in some detail our motivation for being good Christians. There may be many factors that influence how we behave. For example, most of us think it's important that people see us in a favourable way. We want to be liked, respected and admired by others. Therefore we act in ways that earn the respect of those around us. In practical terms, this means that we try to be valuable and productive members of society. We work hard, bring up our children well and are agreeable and respectful of others. Another strong motivator for our behaviour is our natural desire to fit in and not to stand out. This is particularly true in countries or cultures that are more collectivistic in their outlook. In such cultures there is the strong desire to consider the wider society and not to be selfish or individualistic. In such cultures people suppress their own desires and act in ways that benefit the broader society. So you see there are many factors, both internal and external, that shape the way we act. Paul in his letter to Titus, of course, is thinking beyond the factors that make us behave well here on earth. Titus is preparing those in his charge, not only for their life here on earth, but for all eternity. So Paul wants Titus to instruct them on what should be their motivation for being good people. It's not that they are respected or admired by others. It's not that they fit in well in their communities. It's not that they can have a comfortable, stress-free life. What should make them desire to be good and godly people is God's grace or his undeserved kindness. When we fully appreciate what God did for miserable sinners like us, it should make us stop and think. It should make us consider what response God's grace ought to elicit from us. In this regard, grace is like a teacher. Good teachers encourage us to take notice and to see things in ways perhaps we had not before. When we fully appreciate the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, we should be motivated to be better people. It should motivate us to say no to the things that God hates. It ought to encourage us to flee from temptation. It should motivate us to resist the worldly lusts around us. The world may chase after money, pleasure and the satisfaction of their carnal desires but as followers of Christ we must rise above such things. We are not to be focused solely on the here and now but we are instead to have an eternal perspective. Therefore we are to live good lives whilst we are here on earth. We are to be self-controlled, modest, self-restrained and righteous. We are to live in this way as we eagerly anticipate the return of our Lord and Saviour. We do not want him to return to find us living a shameful, sin-filled life. Whilst we are waiting for Christ's return, we are to be eager to do good works. In every age there is plenty of work to be done for God's kingdom. There are always widows and orphans who need care. There is always evil and wickedness to be combated. And there are always people who need to hear the gospel message. Therefore we are called to live good lives and positively influence the world around us. Today Paul will talk about how grace should motivate us to behave in the societies in which we live. Simply put, we might rephrase it as, how am I to live and operate as a Christian? We are very fortunate to be believers living in South Korea. God in his grace and mercy has given us a good place in which to live and to practice our faith. Too often, I think, we take the freedoms that we have been given for granted. 
We are so fortunate that we do not face persecution or harassment from the government or society at large. We can freely and openly live and practice our faith. We are able to do good and to impact the world around us. Many around the world do not enjoy the things that we take for granted. So I urge you to please keep the persecuted church always in your prayers. The Christians living on Crete in Paul's day had a difficult existence. They were living under Roman rule and the Romans had issues with Christianity. The problem, when simplified, was that both the Greeks and the Romans were not monotheistic. They embraced and welcomed a large number of gods and did not want to single any particular god out as being special. This meant for a largely peaceful empire. As long as you were tolerant of others and agreed to worship the emperor, you could devote yourself to whatever god you chose. All beliefs or religious systems were tolerated and considered to be equal. It was a system that everyone, or nearly everyone in the Roman Empire, bought into. The two groups that could never embrace a polytheistic worldview were of course the Jews and Christians. Christians would not worship either gods and certainly would not bow down to the emperor. This meant that the authorities saw them as a potential threat. They were worried that their ideas maybe would spread and lead to revolution and this fear resulted in the authorities keeping a very close eye on Christians. Christians were also, of course, of great interest to their pagan neighbours. Here was a new group of people who claimed to have the truth. They followed a set of beliefs that promoted love, toleration and respect for all. Naturally then Christians were watched to see how well they matched up to the ideals that they preached. So in today's message, Paul writes to Titus to instruct him on how we should act in regard to those in authority over us and to our non-believing neighbours. Verse number one. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. Paul's first instruction is for Titus to give a reminder to those in his charge. The fact that they are to be reminded tells us two things. Firstly, that they already knew these things. We cannot be reminded of something that we do not know. So clearly Paul had spoken to them about these issues when he had been preaching on Crete. The second thing it tells us is that they had forgotten what they had been told. I don't, for example, need to remind my daughter to brush her teeth when she diligently does it every day. The sad truth is that we frequently need to be reminded of what we once knew but may have forgotten. What is it then that Titus is to remind them? It is that they are to be subject to rulers and authorities. The word subject here is the Greek word hupatasso, and it means to come under the authority of, or simply to obey. So who is it that we are to come under the authority of? We are to obey the rulers and authorities that are put in place over us. In the King James Bible, this is rendered principalities and powers, and it refers to those in positions of authority and power. Today we call such people councillors, magistrates, local government or civil leaders. Basically it refers to all forms and levels of human government. In Paul's day there were Roman provincial governors, and above them the emperor himself. Now let us for a moment think about the situation for those living on ancient Crete. Historians tell us that they were not very happy with life under Roman rule. No doubt they wished, just like the Jews in Palestine, to be free of their Roman occupiers. I'm sure that they wished that they could devise their own laws and that they would not be subject to Roman occupation and particularly Roman taxes. According to the historians Polybius and Plutarch, the Cretans were inclined to revolt. We've spoken before about the character of the people of Crete. So it's not a stretch to think that such people harboured rebellious tendencies. I think that we can imagine there being resentment and anger bubbling away just below the surface. In such a situation, it would be common to challenge Roman laws, to disobey the rules, and to be an uncooperative, rebellious citizen. Christians too would have had these same feelings of resentment and unease, 
and they too may have been tempted to be rebellious and to resist the power of the state. However, Paul tells Titus that this was not the way that Christians should behave. They are called upon to set a good example to others, and to willingly obey those in authority. I like what one of the commentaries that I read on this passage said about our Christian duty to government. It said that we are to obey, pay and pray. We are to willingly obey the laws of the land. We are to pay our taxes without complaint. And we are to pray for those in authority over us. Why are we to act in this way? Well, the reason is that it is God who has placed these people in charge. As Paul writes in Romans, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Romans 13 verse 1 Now some may raise an objection here and ask about possible exceptions. People I've noticed are always keen to find loopholes or exceptions. So they ask, are we still called to submit and obey wicked or bad rulers? What about if government laws go against our conscience? Well, these are good questions and specific situations may need careful consideration. But in general, the Bible's teaching is plain. As long as the laws of the land do not contradict the laws of God, we should be perfectly willing to obey them. However, when human authorities and the laws that they pass contradict God's laws, we must obey God rather than men. Paul then goes on to talk about our duty to be ready for every good work. We should as believers willingly obey our rulers in a passive way. We might however be content to live peacefully and to not do very little to help those around us. And I think this is the attitude of most believers today. But Paul tells us here that such an attitude is a negation of our Christian duty. We should always be looking for opportunities to love, help, support and encourage others. Now our good works may be connected to the church, but we should not be limited only to helping the church or things connected to the church. So, for example, if the church runs a soup kitchen for the homeless, it would be good for us to volunteer and help. But equally, it's also beneficial for the community if you volunteer to help with a reading plan in the local library, for example. The message is basically this. Look for ways to help, and then help. We all live in communities in which we should demonstrate the love of Christ through our efforts. And Christians have often excelled in this area providing food and shelter for the homeless and building orphanages, for example, are some good examples. No follower of Christ ought to be urged, coaxed or compelled to do good works. They instead should see it as a great joy and blessing to be able to share Christ's love to others. So let's see what Paul has to say about our treatment of those around us. Verse 2. To speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. It often amazes me how social media has revolutionised our lives in such a short time. I grew up in a world without Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube and the many other forms of mass communication available today. So I struggle to understand why people invest so much time and effort in them. Maybe I'm too old, but I just don't get the fascination. I mean, who really cares what some celebrity is doing or what they think about a particular issue? One of the unintended consequences of social media has been the rise of hate and vitriol against other users. When people can hide their true identity, it often results in incredible unkindness and cruelty. People online threaten to destroy, kill or hurt others just because they disagree with them about an often trivial issue. Social media is full of people speaking evilly about one another. Naturally, as Christians, this is not something that we should do. We are, Paul tells us, to speak evil of no one. This term, to speak evil, is the Greek word blasphemeo. It means to speak evilly or badly about someone, or through lies to damage the reputation of someone. We must never delight in running people down or speaking badly about them. We should also try to be peaceable. This is the Greek word amakasos. 
in the King James Bible, it is translated as brawler. It really means that we are not to be fighting, either verbally or physically, with our neighbours. We should not be contentious or quarrelsome people. Instead, we should be gentle and humble to all men. I like the way that this particular Bible commentator summarises how we are to behave. He writes, Ready to yield personal advantage, eager to help the needy, kind to the weak, considerate towards the fallen, always filled with the spirit of sweet reasonableness. This attitude or disposition towards other people is not simply built upon our desire to be good neighbours. We treat other people with kindness and respect because we truly know who they are. Pagans believe that human beings evolve from ape-like creatures, and to them we are little more than highly intelligent animals. But this is not the reality. We were created by a loving God, and we are the pinnacle of his awesome creation because we are designed and created in his image. So we treat other people with love and kindness because even though they may be wicked, mean or vindictive, they are made in God's image. In our final verse today, Paul will remind us why we are to extend this love and kindness to others. It is because, but for God's grace and mercy, we once were just like them. Verse 3 For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Because God's call to salvation comes at different times for different people, Christians often have interesting histories. There are Christians who have been slave traders, serial killers, mass murderers, abortionists, prostitutes, drug dealers, gang members, armed robbers, and even you. God's will in the matter of election cannot be thwarted by men. If God has determined to save you, you will be saved. So Paul's point here is obvious. Prior to receiving God's call, you swam happily in the sea of your sins. Let us call our time before knowing Christ as before Christ BC. Let us term the time after we received God's call and felt the power of the Holy Spirit after Christ. AC. In your life BC, you led a wicked and sinful life. Now I know that most people see themselves as being good people, but that's not God's view. Our human view is distorted, and only God sees clearly. He sees that all men are evil and wicked. No man since the fall is able through their own efforts to save themselves. That was why he sent us a saviour. Now, thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ, things are different. So now in your life, AC, you have been transformed. Your old way of life and thinking is resigned to the past. When you look back at your life, BC, I'm sure that you can identify some of the things that Paul highlights. I'm sure that you held foolish ideas about things. Perhaps you believed in evolution. Maybe you thought that abortion was okay. Prior to knowing Christ, you were not greatly troubled by your sins, and you certainly did not understand the true nature of the God of the universe. But now that you are enlightened, you see things as God see them, sees them. In your life, BC, you were disobedient. You rebelled against God's authority. You did things the way that you wanted. You were obstinate and selfish. But now you willingly submit and obey the Lord. In your life BC, you were deceived. You were persuaded by things that were simply not true. But now you seek out what is true, what is lovely, what is holy and what is good. In your life BC, you were devoted to satisfying the lusts of the flesh. The desire for fame, prestige, honour, money, sex, power. The need to put your own pleasure and happiness before anything else and you allowed these things to master and to control you. But now, with God's help, you have mastered these things. Now it is you, and not them, that is in control. In your life, BC, you lived in malice and envy. You hated that other people had things that you did not. You were jealous and bitter. 
you wanted the good things that God in his grace had given to others. But now you are content and happy with what you have. Finally in your life, BC, you were full of hatred. You hated others and wished them nothing good. But now things are different. Because Christ loved you, despite you being a miserable wretch, you want to extend that love to others. Others may appear unlovable, but once so were you. Next time Paul will explain why exactly it is that we can live now in this loving way towards others. Things to think about. I have four comments to make on today's passage. Number one, be wary of your rebellious heart. As human beings, our natural inclination is to be rebellious. This is because rebellion is rooted in pride. We don't like to be told what to do because we think that we know best. We want to strongly resist anyone or anything that is trying to control us. What harm and damage this causes. When we rebel against those that God has put in authority over us, it only ever ends badly. In politics, it results in revolutions, military coups, instability and tyranny. In the home, it leads to unhappy marriages, domestic violence and sometimes even murder. So let us then be wary of our rebellious tendencies. Let us seek God's help in willingly submitting. Number two, be ready and willing to do good. Let me give you a thought experiment. I want you to imagine that every Christian in Anyang was at all times ready and willing to do good. Not to just think about doing good, but to actively engage in doing good. Imagine how our city could be transformed. Imagine what an impact we could have. Let us then be ready and willing to put our faith into action. Number three, speak evil of no one. James in his short letter talks about the power of the tongue. Such a small, insignificant part of the body, and yet so powerful. How easy it is to let it run out of control. How easy it is to let ourselves speak wicked and evil things about others. Others, remember, who are made in the likeness and image of God. Let us then be careful not to speak evil of others. And finally, number four, don't forget who you once were. It's interesting to watch how people change after they've been promoted. I have worked with people who change from being very easygoing and friendly people to becoming pompous and authoritarian. It seems that in a very short amount of time, they have forgotten who they once were. The same can sometimes be said for Christians. How some Christians like to look down and sneer at others. They don't want the person with a disreputable past to come to their church or sit next to them in the pew. Let us then never forget who we once were. Let us remember God's love for us and extend that to others. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. That having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying. And these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law. For they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, 
knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. When I send Artemis to you, or Tychicus, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Send Zenus the lawyer and Apollos on their journey with haste, that they may lack nothing. And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. All who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. Amen.